Well, let's get right to it, okay? Miles Davis. I've been a fan of Miles Davis for as long as I've had a record player. Miles Davis is one of the greatest musicians and musical innovators in the history of this country. For 40 years, our guest today has been a star, he has been a leader who has defied category, and he has been an authority figure in music. And everybody has, uh, has an opinion on Miles Davis. This is what Felicia Rashad told me about Miles Davis. Well, he's my husband's favorite. He's my brother Texas' favorite. He's Bill Cosby's favorite. But Miles Davis is really my favorite. All right, that's Felicia. Now, here's Miles Davis in action. And uh, here's Miles Davis in person. Thank you. Thank you. Right here. I uh, see you're still shopping at Brooks Brothers. Ah. <laughs> Maz, I want to thank you very much for coming down to be with us on Time Out. Uh oh. How was, the, um, how was the limo ride down here? It was okay. I went to sleep. Yeah? I went to sleep. Well, now that you're here, I thought maybe I'd ask you, like, the most important musical question I could ask you. What? What do you think of the Beach Boys? <laughs> Very fine, but... Um, Let me drink some of this water. You got your iced... I think it's iced tea. Iced tea or whatever oh, yeah? you requested. Uh, Miles, the... Um, you were either at the dawn or responsible for so many different interesting phases of American music. You know, the dawn of bebop, the birth of the cool, the quiet stuff with its tonality, Sketches of Spain, which many people say, you know, is like a harbinger of the whole new, new, uh, new age, quiet new age music. Bitches Brew, which. Wait, 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 wait. What did you say, Sketches of Spain? Sketches of Spain. People, music critics have written that Sketches of Spain is like a. Um, no, they, they wouldn't. I've heard, I read it. A critic. Which is, it's a, it's a. It's a Spanish album. We did a lot of research on it. It has nothing to do with, um, you know, like imp improvising, like we do today. No. It was, um, we got a lot of uh, vamps from the in Indians in South America. And we did uh, flamenco music, which is like, it's like our blues, but it's Spanish. And uh, Mexican, we did a Mexican folk song and a vamp from the Indians in South America. That's all it was. Well, anyway, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the importance that's, that some critics are attaching to the album as an important album is that if you look at some of the stuff that's being done today, I mean, this whole series of records and cassettes um, that has that kind of feeling to it. And then Bitches Brew, which... Those are entirely different, though. I know, they're all That's different. what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, I know. What, what, my, my, this is my question. I want to know whether or not you're, with Tutu, which I think is an excellent, an excellent piece of work, you're defining a new phase. As each one of those other things allegedly defined a new phase. People 
categorize you in certain ways. You keep coming up with fresh stuff, never repeat yourself, and don't look back. So how, what would you say you're doing now? Tutu is just like an advertisement, you know. It's, we laid the track down and I played over it. But in person, it's different. That's all the records are that we do. It's, it's like, well, when you hear it, it's, it's a hundred times different. You know, when you hear it in person. Right. Yeah. But when I lay down uh, anything on, on <clears throat> by the cassette, it's like an advertisement of what, what we're going to do when we do a concert. Yeah. You know, it's not to be... It, it says, come to see us. That's what it does. Well, yeah, speaking of that, coming to see you, and I said to people, you know, a lot of people, maybe I've seen you a few times, I saw you at A.B. Fisher Hall and recently at Lehigh College in Bethlehem. I see a performer on stage who's moving around. He's having... <laughs> Fun with the audience, you know, tickling a girl's head and stuff like that. But yet I say to people, Miles Davis, and what do they say? Miles Davis plays with his back to the audience. I mean, that's what people say about you. How did that start? And would you be more comfortable sitting with your back to the audience now? <laughs> now um, like in this room, it's different sounds in each part of this room. So I just walk around and pick up on the sound. It makes the trumpet sound. Yeah. What I want to hear. If it's a if it's a sound, if it's a space here, and I can play a certain note that I like, a passage, and it would sound good to me, rather than over here, I walk over you here. You move to that space. Right. So I mean, the origin of this is not. I don't care about the audience. It's the sound that you're looking for on stage. I mean, is that basically the origin That's of that it. whole thing? That's it. When I got. I asked to, to have a trumpet here, not because this is why. <laughs> That's why I asked. When you look at a trumpet, can you define your feelings for it? Not really, until I touch it. See, I couldn't play this. What's wrong with it? It's too heavy and it's, it's too trumpety. <laughs> okay. could, we, could we show you something in a flute? You know, but I mean, it's, I can't, I can't, I couldn't do nothing with this. No. Nope. And it doesn't match my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll be back with more with Miles Davis right after this. Davis. Miles, someone, someone told me that you play your music differently in different parts of the world. That, you know, you might play a little differently in Japan, then you play in Sweden, then you play in South America. Is that basically true? Yeah. In, uh, for instance, um, Rio de Janeiro, we play there for three days. Those people feel full of rhythm. You know, they're like black people. They're full of rhythm. And they memorize they almost memorized our whole set. <laughs> and then we were, went from there to Germany. And that, going from there to Germany is like playing handball with the drapes. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. A little bit into the deep freeze there, huh? Well, you know, it's they, you know, just like this. How about... Um, no fizz. Japan. How about Japan? What's it like playing there? They love me. All kinds. And also, I've heard you're fascinated by Japanese culture. I mean, you wear basically kind of Japanese-designed clothes, right? Well, this is from Kevin Lee Mart in, uh, in New York. 
by one of my good friends, Isemiyaki. Yeah. And um, what's his name? Koshin, yeah, Koshin Sota. He also gives me, wear this, Miles, wear this, wear this, Hong Kong, wear this. He made two jackets for me, you know, with with um, metal. Yeah. Yeah. He, he made the jacket I wore on the Grammys. Yeah, that's right. Miles, the, um, you got into painting at somewhere along the line. We've mm -hmm. got some of your things that we can put up and look at. Uh, what got you into painting? My father, I guess he figured if if I were, was going to be a dental surgeon like he was, I should learn how to use my hands. But you're already using your hands. I mean, even as you sit here now, you're using oh, your hands just to just to keep the fingers uh, the fingers loose. So I, mean, I want to call for the videotape so we can look at that of uh, uh, some of your paintings. But your father gave you a trumpet. Your mother gave you a violin for your thirteenth birthday. What mm. if your mother had prevailed? It wouldn't have made any difference. I know. Here's this is the first of uh, first of your paintings. You generally work with what? Watercolor sketches. What can I see? You can see it right there. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but you did it because it had your name on it. <laughs> You got a bigger screen you can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, we got another one coming along here. We, when we, when I opened these up, the, the, the go to video again, when I opened the, the, the paintings up in the office and I, I took them out of the big box, I spread them out. Lawyer, our director said, That's a jazz mind. And I thought, Well, that's kind of interesting. I don't know. I mean, how. I know what it means. It means that the, 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 the figures have rhythm. Yeah. You know, I, I draw dancers like it. Yeah. You know. We have another, you have another one of those things ready to go we can take a look at? All right, here. Let's, uh, here we go again. It's upside down. It's upside down. <laughs> yeah. no, just go no, to your no, set no. and reverse the that's, angle. That's, of the that's, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, okay. You got it? You see that leg sticking up there? It's my leg. No, no, no. Your leg is the wrong color. <laughs> The, um, there was a period, Miles, in the 19, late 70s when you were really ill. You had, what, two broken legs? They weren't broken. I had two fractured ankles, but not, not, not a broken Parts of leg. your legs were broken. And, and I heard you had some bone disease or something like that. But the point I'm getting at is... It just, my, my hip just did that and stopped. You know, I had two operations. And the first one was seven years from the, the second one. Right. And they went in and it, it, and it collapsed, and so they put a, a new one in. But there was this period, like, for about four years, when you were away from the, the instrument. Yeah. And you came back with that album, Man with a Horn, which was like a great comeback album of the year, people said. What was it, I, mean, I read that you said you didn't even miss playing. What was it that got you back? One day Dizzy came over. Dizzy goes. One day Dizzy came over. Dizzy goes. He said, "What the fuck are you doing here?" I mean, just kind of, just kind of sitting there, not doing anything. Yeah. yeah. You supposed to be. What's wrong with you? Yeah. I said, "Man, get out of my house." Said, well, if you know Dizzy, so I thought about it. And it just, I started back to playing. For sure. Yeah. How do you attribute, I mean, you, when the, you play the trumpet, you speak with a sound, you speak with a tone, totally different than any other player. 
how do you attribute that you can hear Miles Davis anywhere on any record and you say that is Miles Davis how does that happen how did that happen that way first place you have to hold long notes for days hours and um, I used to go on my father's my father had a, a large farm yeah outside of St. Yeah, Louis Jim, gentleman farm so we had a lake and I used to practice that playing out over the lake yeah because the water makes the sound carry but but you have to hear your sound I, I used to ask Dizzy I said why is it that I can't play like you he said you play the same thing I do but you play it in the lower register my sound comes from also my instructor, Elwood Buchanan in St. Louis. I used to love the way he would hold, hold a horn. It's the look. You have to get that look first. Well, well when, when we so see you, you holding a horn, you're holding it's a down. That's what I, when I see Miles Davis, it's like that back posture and then the horn it seems to be going down. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I can't play I thought that's what I've been saying all these years. I want to ask you about two other artists, very different great black artists, Prince and Duke Ellington. All right? Your thoughts on Prince, your impressions of him as an artist. I think Prince is one of America's greatest poets. Now, today, and he's like a genius. He is a genius. The fact that he can write those many words those lyrics. One of, one of his songs could be a book. You know? And he, I told him, I told him, I said, I said, Prince, you know you have a lot of Charlie Chaplin in you. <laughs> you, ever, you ever see Charlie? Sure. What did he say? He just smiles, isn't it? He just smiles, you know? I, I read that he sent you a letter signed at God. Right. That's what I heard. All right, now, Duke Ellington. We have just a, a, a very early film clip here. If you want to just check out the monitor, just a few seconds of Duke Ellington, and then your thoughts on Duke Ellington. Your impressions and the effect that Duke Ellington may or may not have had on you, Miles Davis. Well, in, in, in St. Louis, the only record we had that my mother got was Duke, Duke Ellington and she had Duke and uh, something else she had. But I didn't know my mother could play piano until I was about 26. A well-kept secret. I forgot my, my, my uh, grandmother taught organ, because I just tuned my grandmother out. <laughs> I, every time I used to pass by her, she would to pick up my brother, right? Yeah. She'd pick him up. He never did hit the ground until he was about four. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, wait a second, hold it. I want to I want to hear about the Duke Ellington. You're, is, is any special? Well, it had M. M. C. M. J. Blues. That was written for John for for Jimmy Bland. Uh -huh. He was from St. Louis. That's the only one she had. And this this is how they used to play. Um pa um pa um pa. Mm. But Duke Duke, uh, he's he's responsible for the way Gil Rice, Gil Evans. Gil Evans, who did. You can never match that sound in here. That's that tonality that I was talking about when I was trying to describe, you know, the different phases of Miles Davis. When you talk about that kind of blue and the quiet nights, that tonality is brilliant. Well, it, this comes from Duke. You yeah. know, he, he uh, doubled the lead. You know, the, the, the lead saxophone? Mm -hmm. He's but, the double the lead. This is what we're going to do. We have f a few gifted trumpet players from the Philadelphia public school system. We're going to play a little bit. 
in the next segment, and they each have a question for Miles Davis. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Pretty, that's directed by Spike Lee. That's a music video to Tutu, and this is the album, which is a terrific album. Nice, nice shot of you, Miles, on the cover mm. here. Um, you mentioned before about Dizzy Gillespie. Was just, Dizzy was like a mentor to you in the early days in New York, right? Yeah, Dizzy and Clark Terry. Clark Terry from St. Louis. Harry James. You were actually Charlie Parker's roommate for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, no? Mm -hmm. that, see how this stuff, I read that like three places. You weren't his roommate. They can tell you read it. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Was, I mean, uh, I wasn't there at the time. I had yeah, to read it. We were just in the same building. Oh. The room cost $8 a week. And uh, he could, he, I told him about the room, because it was, it was a placement place from uh, Julio. Yeah, because you're at Julio. Room, so, so he got one. Anyway, this is, we got a little tape here at Dizzy Gillespie in action. Then I'll show you what we're up to with our, we had young Miles in the wings. Mm. So, Miles, if he was your mentor, how come your cheeks don't do that? Because I, I started off, my instructor showed me how to play non pressure. With no, you know, just like that. Dizzy asked me to, to uh, teach him how to do like that. Mm. I said, You kidding? Wait. Don't want to change said, it. No, he, he asked me about 10 years ago about that. Yeah. Have you taught many people to play the trumpet? Mm, I used to give lessons when I was about 14 to a little, little fat guy. His mother wanted him to be in the band. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, we have, a, we have a, a fellow here. He's 13 years old. He's in Philadelphia Public School System. His name is Jumaine McEnnis, and his nickname is, come on out, his nickname is Little Miles. Come on out. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Thank you, 
you very much for coming. Now, you're, you're the same age as Miles Davis was when, when Miles started to play. Do you have any question or anything you'd like to ask Miles? Mm, that was my question, was since he answered it. <laughs> Whoa! How old was he when he started, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. How'd he sound, Miles? He needs to practice. He knows how he sounds. He knows. Yeah. All right. I she thank you. She played in more. the key, the, the other key. She played in E flat. You played in D natural? Yeah. 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 Miles is suggesting another key. Mm -hmm. All right, let me move on to. E flat. E flat, right? Let me move on to our next fellow who is Jasper Barron, who's going to do walking. He's 15 years old. Come on out. Thank you. Come on. Out. Jafar, Jafar Brown, excuse me. you'd like to ask Miles about trumpet or yes. whatever? Um, what are you going to be doing in the future? Playing the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean on record? Um, what kind of music? Uh, what kind, what of, kind music? of music? Uh-huh. The next album? Right. Uh, uh, you ever hear an African group called Kasu? Nah. Where's Quincy? We we'll get Quincy at who's uh, writing a biography on Miles. It's, it's an African group. They, um, they have a French, you know, they're French anyway, they speak French. They have a French brass section, and it's African. So I told Marcus and uh, uh, Larry Black with Cameo to write a reggae, right? So we'll be doing that. He wrote one. And it has two words. It has some vocal with it. Good. You going to do your rap song? I just wrote one the other day. Yeah, he's doing a rap song on the bus. I thank you, Jafar. All right. Uh, 18 years old. Here is Frederick Goodson. Hey, Frederick. Frederick Goodson. I think we put you guys in kind of a difficult position here, and you're, you're, good, you're good to come in and do it. Frederick, uh, what would you like to ask Mr. Davis? Uh, I want to ask Mr. Davis, what, music, what direction does he think jazz music is going into? 
as in music in general? Well, you just it'll be more uh, patches on the keyboards, synthesizers, and you have to match them. Play against sounds. That's what, that's where it's, it's going. Playing against sounds. I was I'm fascinated to see in this Tutu album that what is it? Marcus Miller play, is playing most of the instruments, and there's a tremendous amount of electronic layering, right, on that. Yeah. yeah. You, like I said, just a, a record is like an adverse, you know, it's like an advertised thing. You know, it doesn't, you, you play it much better in person. All right. One final fella, John Swanna. John. Hey. hey, John. like to ask Miles? Um, have you heard about the new electric valve instrument? The Akai? The EVI? The new e electric? The trumpet? They hook it up to the keyboard? No, it's oh, like a... Oh, yeah, they, they, they gave me two of those. What's that? Japan, Japanese company. Yeah. Yeah, they gave me a bunch of stuff. Do you have to play it? I mean, do you actually blow through it? Yeah, you blow through what's it. Your, what's your organ player's name? The organ player here? Oh, let's, let's actually take a minute and meet the man. I thank you very much. We got Joey DeFranco on keyboards. Hi, Joey. How you doing? And on drums, we got Stacy Dozier in the back. And Christian McBride on bass. When we return, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Maurice Hines, who's been working for the past year of his life on the Louis Armstrong musical Satchmo. We're going to talk about Louis Armstrong right after this. We'll be right back. <laughs> Putting together the show, I, I kept saying, you know, I I want to hear Miles Davis talk a little bit about Louis Armstrong and oh, just a little. I don't know anything about him. <laughs> Similar instrument, uh, and also Maurice Hines, who's a, a good friend of mine, uh, has been choreographing the Satchmo musical, which got some good reviews, got some mixed reviews. And the, the, it's a musical Louis Armstrong. Actually, as we'll find out, it's kind of written by Louis Armstrong. We'll find out about that. Let's have a nice welcome for. A great dancer, choreographer, and future star of the Sid Caesar uh, show on CBS, Maurice Hines. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Oh. When, uh, when did you uh, first meet Miles Davis? Well, I was very, we were both very young, Miles. We were both, very, <laughs> we were both babies. <laughs> a long, long time ago. It's always a pleasure to, to see him and, and hear him. You know, and I was thinking how wonderful for these young men and, uh, to meet him. Because when I first met my idol, which was Fayard Nicholas of the Nicholas Brothers. That's right. You know, I couldn't believe that I was meeting this man with these hands. Yeah, you know, I, I'm sitting over here casually watching these guys play the trumpet. And oh. then it really occurred to me. Oh, it's terror. Like it's almost terror. Yeah. You know, what am I going to ask about well, Davis? I can imagine what they went through. Well, let, let's focus on what the last year of your life or so and Louis Armstrong. We have uh, just a little bit of Louis Armstrong playing, and then we'll get into what you've been doing on, on a musical stage. Sure.
Wonderful. Louis Armstrong. No, it's, that's, that's basically the only clip we could get of Louis really? Armstrong playing. Yeah. That's at, good, at, good. At I must say this first. Say it. I have to say it because it's about Miles. When I first was exposed to his music as, a, as really focusing in on it was Bitches Brew. Ah. And I remember my father was the drummer at that time. He used to bring all and expose Gregory and I to great music. Great. And I remember every time, and we were working the Apollo a lot at that time as a dance team, Everybody would try to analyze, over, over analyze. Well, you know, Miles is into this and Miles is into yeah. I never could get into that. I got how he made me feel. Me too. That's mm. how, I didn't want to say, this is what he did and this is what he was feeling when he played. I don't know the man. I know mm. what he was feeling. But I know how it made me feel. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I got it, totally. And it's still the same. You know, Chase? So when I was, when we were doing research on Louis's music, they did that with Louis too. You know, mm -hmm. people come up to you and they say, well, you know, Louis was feeling good this day and that's why he played that way. <laughs> oh, please, mm -hmm. back in, in the 30s. Oh, I know. So, but what, when I hear like Tutu and everything, automatically I think of how it makes me feel movement-wise. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to do a ballet about Miles is what I'm going to do. Right. Oh, sure, it'll either be for Haley. Because with Satchel, I've gotten all this, they're comparing me to Jerome Robbins, and so now I'm getting these offers. And I'm watching it, and you know how Miles you're the black, you the black Jerome Robbins? You believe that? I wish I said Ailey. Alvin Ailey would have been better. Right. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, Alvin. So, uh, but the, you see where Miles stands? Yeah. I mean, right away, you're inspired as a choreographer to do that whole hey, thing. We can put some music on, and you can try it out now if you want. Oh, no, it's all in my mind. I see. You know, it's all in my mind how he makes you feel. You have and to have that's, something, you know, have to have something to match it with. That's right. You've got you to go do and do right. research. No. You've got to listen to everything. I'm just kidding about that. Now, with Louis, what's wonderful about Satchmo is that I wouldn't get involved with the project. As you know, you know me, yeah. uh, if it was, wasn't done with integrity in class. That's why I don't work a lot. Because <laughs> I'm offered a lot of things without integrity in class. So I don't work a lot. So, but this did. And the reason why is that Lucille... Had That's Louis Armstrong's Louis wife. Armstrong's yeah. wife. Mm -hmm. uh, she had seen a movie version of uh, Armstrong that ABC had done, and she thought he was portrayed as an Uncle Tom, and she refused to do anything with anybody else. You know, you, I th that somebody asked me, did I want to see this? Did I see this show? Mm -hmm. But I was afraid that was going to come up. I know? know. But they don't realize that Louis was doing that when he was around his friends. You know, That's he's right. acting the same way, uh -huh. but when you do it in front of white folks and try to make them enjoy what you, what you feel, mm -hmm. that's what he was doing, right? Right. They call him Uncle Tom. Yes. They had all these phrases about the man, which yeah. was so wrong to put on him. Well, he, she had a thousand, Louis taped everything. He had a thousand, she had a thousand tapes that no one had ever heard of Louis just talking about his life mm -hmm. that she gave to Jerry Bullock, the writer who wrote the show. Uh, six months before she passed away. It took him two years to talk with her and for her to trust him. I would bet that the, the script that comes out of that is in a way unbelievable. It's that, unbelievable. Yeah, so unbelievable. They it, think it's fiction. That, 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 because it. people didn't know that Louis, way before everybody else did it, talked about the government with the, the segregation in, in uh, Little Rock, uh, uh, Arkansas. In, uh, not in Arkansas. Yeah. In mm -hmm. Arkansas. And that was during Eisenhower. See, people, they, don't, they have no idea about Louis. All mm -hmm. this idea, like you said, they, mm -hmm. like when white people looked at him, they thought he was Uncle Tom. So That's the way he always was. They think yeah. it's revisionist, mm -hmm. but it's basically his words. That's right. We got a, a video, a, a clip of your choreography. Oh. And who's playing <laughs> Louis? Oh, Byron Stripling. Do you know Byron? Uh, no, he, I don't think so. he came from the playing first chair at the Count Basie band and was in oh, Clark yeah? Terry's band. And he loves Clark, as I do. And uh, of course, I've heard Miles talking yeah. about it with me. All right, let's take a look. Control. This is from Satchmo. Well, I don't even know what number you're doing. Well, we'll see right now.
All right, best of the Sash Mom. This is coming to the Forest Theater the second week in November. You two with me already? <laughs> no, not yet. Miles, did Louis Armstrong have any artistic impact on you at all? Yeah. You can hear my tone and tell. Louis and Roy, or Elvis, yeah. Mm. And Dizzy. Dizzy, like Roy, and Roy must have liked Louis. It goes on down, you know. And uh, Roy probably like, uh, with the Trump, uh, I can't remember his name. But it goes on down the line like if you back it up, you know. It's like I like Dizzy and Clark Terry. I was a Clark Terry fan. I yeah, love yeah. Clark Terry. Yeah, he's, he plays a flugelhorn. Yes, I loved him. And a wonderful person, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just saw uh, Sweets, too, recently. Yeah. Sweets Anderson, yeah. Play at the Blue Note. Yeah. Well, Maurice, you know, when I talked to you on the phone about this uh, over the weekend, I said, is there anything that you have been wondering about Miles Davis in your life? For a question. You know, when you told me that, I said, yeah. oh, I'm going to try to manufacture this. No, you know, I, because I don't wonder about his personal life at all. And I don't wonder why he plays the way he does. I just enjoy it because, like I said, it makes me feel something. Yeah, me too. And I, and I don't want to know how he gets it or Did why he gets it. Well, you played drums when I first met you. No, Greg, we played. And Greg was I was into drums. trying to play the vibes. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because uh, Lionel Hampton gave me a set of vibes. So I was into playing that. And then I, but I found myself, because I loved musicians, because I liked the way they made me feel. It was I was happy around them. We worked mm -hmm. at the Apollo for many, many years with Willis Jackson and all oh, these yeah. bands, and worked with Count Basie and Duke, and they made me feel good. But mine manifests itself in movement. Absolutely. So that's yeah. really, like in, in Satchel, there's a ballet about how Louis loved one night stands. Mm -hmm. So we do a ballet where Byron plays, and the dancers portray all these, these different ballrooms that he played in. And that's what I, I try to, you'll see, you'll love it. I'm looking forward to it. It's coming in Forest Theater in March. I, I End of to, November. End of November. In November. You'll be back then. We'll have more time then. But I want to take a break because I want to see if we can squeeze in one or two audience questions from Miles Davis after this, okay? Yeah. Maurice, thank you. My pleasure. We'll return right after this. <laughs> First, moving fast, as many audience questions as possible. Do you like the All City Jazz Trio, Miles? Yeah. Very good. Right. Very good. All right. Questions, as many as we can get. Keep them simple. Wait, wait. First up, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to ask Miles, uh, who is his favorite all-time sideman? Sideman. Including Bird. Mine. I don't know, man. I can't answer that. All right, next question. That's understandable. Yeah. All I want to say, Miles, is this. You're in beautiful health. We heard rumors you were sick. You look well. And you're an American art form in itself. Right. And we love you. Right. Oh, okay. thank you. And I'd like to ask Miles if he saw the movie Round Midnight. And if he has, was that an accurate depiction of jazz musicians during that era? I didn't see it because it's depressing. Um, well, that's but there's a story about Bud, but but Paul, but it's it's it happens to it happened to to uh, Lester Young. It happened to a lot of musicians. It's just the alcohol. That's all. Yes. That's relatively accurate depiction, I think. All right, question over here. Yeah. Yes, I would like to know will you be doing any more guest shots on television? Like what? Like the Miami. Like Vice Miami Vice thing? or anything in that nature because I think he was great you know Miami and Vice they, they sent me a lot of scripts I can't remember whether they want me to write the music or act in it but <laughs> if it's all right you know if, it, if it's if I could do it I just did one with I don't even know the name of it all right we'll see yeah. it at some point thanks now there's a guy up here with a question yes sir yeah could you make so, some sort of a comment of your memories about John Coltrane some memorable experience with him. Boogers out his nose. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody over here? Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Davis who he turns to to uh, get reassurance for his music. Uh, as an who do I do what? Who do you, who do you, who do you turn for, to for criticism? Do you, and do you have someone you know? What do you say? To get, to get reassurance from yourself besides your public. I mean, your public has a. Uh, has an incredible love. Like a love sounding for you. board. Do you have any right, sounding board right. other than yourself for your work? Right. Oh no, the band. The band. They dictate to you what to play. Yeah. 
All right, that's it for questions. We're going to be back and wrap it up right after this. Time is going very quickly. We'll be right back. Bill Box. That man was Miles Davis, and that's how I met him. He saved the night for me, and you gave me a great show today, and I love you and thank you very much. Miles Davis. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Hey, guys.